with the verses that end the Gospel of Matthew. We read them this morning. We've come to the end. We've spent a lot of time over the last number of weeks watching as the story of Jesus' life unfolded. We watched last week his arrest and his death, and then we discovered to our astonishment that his death was not, in fact, the end of the story. Even a tomb with a large stone rolled over the entrance, that did not stand in God's way. But now, although Matthew has run out of words, it turns out that we have not run out of story. For although this is the end of the story that Matthew wrote down for us, it's the beginning of another story, a story that God is still writing to this very day. Because not only could the grave not hold Jesus, but neither could one nation contain him. And Jesus sent his disciples to go make other disciples of all the nations. So we've reached the end of Matthew's Gospel, but by now the story has become so vast, so wide in scope that it's going to flow from this mountaintop where Jesus met his disciples and they are standing together, and like a wave it will wash over the entire world. The call to all nations, as one writer puts it, is breathtakingly wide, and it still is today. When Jesus invited us to make disciples of all nations, that means that there is no room for enemies, no room for others, no room for outsiders in Jesus' commission. But if we were standing there on the mountaintop with Jesus that day, and we'd overheard the job that he had given to his disciples, I wonder if our first thought would have been, really, Jesus? Is it the best idea to give a job like this, so universal in scope, to these people? Are the 11 who stand before you right now really the best chance the world has to make disciples of all nations? After all, right away our text tells us that it was the 11 disciples who went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And that alerts us to something very important. This is an incomplete group. The number 12 has become 11. One of their number has fallen away. Someone who shared their table, who walked with them, who sat at Jesus' feet, who learned what he had to say. This person was not transformed, or at least not transformed enough by his years following Jesus and instead has turned against him. So the number 11 already signals imperfection, even failure that characterizes the disciples of Jesus who are receiving his instructions. And not only is this group incomplete, but we have to look at the remaining folks standing there before the risen Christ as he sends them out into all the world. Peter the denier, Thomas, all the others who cut and ran when Jesus needed them the most. This is not the group of people who showed great courage in the face of danger that accompanied them being associated by Jesus. This is the same group of people who left the burial of Jesus' body to a hitherto unknown follower of Jesus who had some wealth and political clout. This is the group of people who heard the good news of the empty tomb not for themselves, but from the lips of women who showed far more bravery in the face of the crushing reality of Jesus' death. The group of people there on that mountain that day include dull folks who never really got what Jesus was saying and broken people who did not live up to their commitment to stay by Jesus' side to the end. The same group of people spent their precious time with Jesus squabbling about who was the most important person in the kingdom that Jesus taught them about. Over and over again, And most memorably in the events that led up to this in the last week of Jesus' life, the people that were gathered there on the mountain have shown us who they really are. And they are not the brightest, and they are not the most gifted or the bravest. They are not the best of the best that we might expect Jesus was going to send into the world to carry on the work that he started, to carry the good news of Jesus to the end of the earth. So why would Jesus entrust this important but admittedly difficult mission to the people who stood before him. And then in addition to that, we have this little gem of a statement tossed into verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some 
doubted. Now, grammarly speaking, this phrase can mean one of two things. It could either mean that the people who worshipped Jesus, some of them worshipped and some of them doubted, but it could also mean that all of the people both worshipped and had a little bit of doubt sprinkled in. But either way you take it, it is so fascinating that both worship and doubt exist in this group standing before Jesus. After all, these are the same people who heard about the empty tomb, and they had enough faith in what they heard to go from Jerusalem, where they were gathered, to Galilee, where Jesus said he would meet them. And now they have seen the risen Christ with their own eyes. If it is true that seeing is believing, then these people should be experts in believing by now. Their faith should have been utterly confirmed by seeing Jesus in the place he told them he would be. And yet, among this group, there is this mixture of both worship and doubt. And I actually find that detail kind of encouraging. Because we often talk about doubt as though it is the opposite of faith. But in these verses, worship and doubt live side by side together in the followers of Jesus, the same people who saw him go to the cross and then saw him alive again after he had been killed. And even so, there was this mixture of worship and doubt. The people who get the commission to take Jesus' message to the ends of the earth are not the people who have no questions remaining. They're not people who do not wonder if what they're seeing is really true. They are not people who have not been marked or even scarred by the fear and brokenheartedness of what happened to Jesus. They worship, and at the same space and at the same time, they find that lingering, nagging feeling of doubt. And yet Jesus still comes to them, and Jesus meets them there, just as he said he would. So that little detail gives us the idea that faith and doubt are not in opposition to one another, but often part of the same conversation and sometimes even the same breath as one another. Even the people who saw Jesus alive again after he was crucified, who were able to verify the truth of the empty tomb, even those people struggled with doubt. And Jesus still gave them a job, a commission, We've even called it the Great Commission to these disciples. The same ones who have failed, they're incomplete, they're still struggling to believe their eyes, they deal with doubt at the same moment as they fall down in worship. In his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, Eugene Boring writes, whatever the nature of the resurrection event, it did not generate perfect faith, even in those who experienced it firsthand. It is not to angels or perfect believers, but to the worshiping, wavering community of disciples to whom the world mission is entrusted. So the disciples, I would say at this point, are still a work in progress. Indeed, Jesus had a nickname for them while they were still alive. He called them, O ye of little faith. But Eugene Peterson has suggested that perhaps it was more of a nickname like, hey, little faiths. Even still, even with that just a seed of who they will become planted deep in their hearts, Jesus sends these disciples into the world. And the story that we find marveled, marbled all throughout Scripture is none other than that. It's a story of people who, imperfect though they are, grow into the role that God gives them. They become the kind of people that Jesus already sees in them. The Bible tells a story of people called to take the good news far and wide, to take it to the ends of the earth, to include every nation. And in fact, this story started way back in Genesis when God chose Abraham and Sarah, even though they were the least likely candidates and they themselves were flawed people. But God spoke to them and said, through you, we will bless the entire world. And now the words that were spoken to Abraham and Sarah have come back in a huge circle as the risen Jesus sends out his gathered disciples, imperfect though they are, and tells them to take the good news of the entire world to every nation. Because God is always coming to ordinary people, human beings who are still working at being saved, who are works in progress, who are imperfect and have a lot to learn, 
who still struggle to keep up, who worship and sometimes in the same breath have some doubt, but is always people like that with whom God partners. Matthew's Gospel ends so, not so much with an ending as a new beginning. One commentator has said if we picture the entire biblical story from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation as a big hourglass, this person suggests that the verses that end the Gospel of Matthew are that narrow place in the hourglass in the middle where everything that has gone before and everything that will come after will meet and flow together. The rest of the New Testament, we get glimpses of stories of how these disciples, though they were flawed and though they had doubts, and though they might not have been the people we would have chosen if their applications had been filtered through us, but these people are doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. They take the good news of Jesus further and further afield. But it's not only to these people these words are spoken. It was not only these 11 who were meant to hear these words and carry on the work that Jesus sent them to do. One writer says that in the end, we are meant by God to hear these words, to receive a commission from Jesus himself. We too receive this commission. We too have this charge to carry on the work that Jesus began. We take up the torch that has passed to us through generation to generation of followers of Jesus. We are now the ones that God sends into the world that he loves so much, he sent his one and only son. So the commission that ends the Gospel of Matthew is for those on the hillside who hear Jesus utter these words, but it is meant for us as well. And we may have similar questions about ourselves as we have about the people who are gathered before Jesus on the mountaintop in the last scene that we see before the curtain closes on Matthew's Gospel. We too are full of shadows and gray areas. We too struggle with our day-to-day -day realities of life in a world. We too have nagging sins. We too are a jumble of good intentions and mixed motives. We try our best to follow, but so often fall short of the good things that Jesus modeled and taught and asked the world to do. And we might look around at our church today especially the church with the big C, with its scandals involving money and abuse and cover-ups of abuse and human rights violations and terrible relationships with Indigenous peoples, not only here in Canada, but the world over. And we might despair. How can this motley crew of people be the hope of getting the good news of Jesus Christ into the world? Or maybe we look within ourselves and think the same thing. And we certainly, most, or we most certainly need to contend with how these particular verses have been used to justify running roughshod over people and their culture, all in the name of Jesus. But I do want to say a couple of things about that. First of all, this passage begins with Jesus saying this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. Authority, according to one person that I was reading this week, is well understood as followability. We are sent with the authority of Jesus, not because we are worth following, but because Jesus is. Even if we look at our lives and sincerely hope that nobody actually follows our example too closely, we know that we are always pointing to the one who is to be followed, Jesus, the risen Messiah, and he is definitely worth following. It's not because we are faithful that we beckon others to follow Jesus. It is because Jesus is faithful. It is because Jesus is worth following. We go with the good news of Jesus Christ because we point to Jesus. And the second thing I want to say is this. One of the best ways to understand this statement from Jesus, go therefore, is to read it as, as you go, or even better, having gone. Sometimes we get the sense that Jesus is maybe telling us to go somewhere else to make disciples. But we actually don't have to go very far. We don't even have to go door to door or become missionaries to China to do what God is asking of us. As we are going, as we go about our lives, as we go to the grocery store, as we head to work, 
as we care for our family and our friends, as we get to know our neighbors, as we meet people, as we have coffee, as we go to our classes, whatever we do and wherever we go, that is where the work is. The place where we spend our time is the place we begin. The people that we spend our time with are the people who may become followers of Jesus because of our witness in the world. One writer reminds us that these disciples are not an army ordered to make all nations subject, nor are they franchise owners sent out to increase market share for their brand. They are followers of the crucified one, sent to welcome into their motley company, numbskulls, cowards, and squabblers though they are, all of the broken and beautiful people of the world. He continues, disciples, after all, are not slaves. They are a family learning, to grace, learning through grace to love one another. Jesus' friends are teaching everyone, and they also keep learning for themselves to obey all that he taught, which is to say things like, turn the other cheek when you're attacked, to love one another, to love your enemies, and to welcome strangers and neighbors alike into their own community of mutual love. Mistrusting, we hear this call as a burdensome task of conquest done to prove ourselves rather than sharing in the wave of love that overflows into all the world. God is making all things new, including, amazingly, even making all of us damaged and foolish and amazing people of the world into disciples of the one who emptied himself for the life of the world. Learning to love as Jesus loved is the way that we make disciples. I love that. Learning to love as Jesus loved is the way we make disciples. So making disciples is more about our lives and our relationships than it is about a momentary encounter. And perhaps above all other things, we need to hear the very last words of Matthew's gospel. Surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. See, Matthew's gospel not, doesn't just send us into this new beginning with a job to do. It ends with the assurance that as they went and wherever they journeyed, as they proclaimed the message and whatever they did, Jesus did not leave them alone. Instead, Jesus is with us always, walking alongside us, teaching us, helping us, encouraging us, calling to mind the things we need to know, leading us, comforting us, to the very end of the age, until the task is complete. At Jesus' birth, it was declared that this baby was born to be known as God with us. And here as the story ends, or as it begins once again, it ends with this reminder that no matter what we are going through, no matter how much we worship or we doubt or we do both of those things together, no matter if we follow faithfully or not, as we go into the world, we do not go alone. And you might hear that as a threat. Actually, one of my seminary professors suggested it might be a threat, as in, I'm watching you. But you can also hear it as a promise. As we go, we do not go alone, because we go with none other than Jesus, the crucified one who is risen from the dead. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? God of action, you sent your disciples into the world to preach, Teach and make disciples of all nations. Make us instruments of proclamation so that all may know the love you have for humanity. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As you go with we this week, remember that Christ is alive. Alleluia. Under his direction, we too live. Alleluia. Go therefore and let your life reflect God's love. Christ's call and the Spirit's power. Go, therefore, and know that Christ is with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Go in peace.